place where journalists can gather to swap ideas and war stories and, of course, boast and argue, to offer a forum for ideas and debate, and a place where democracy can be advanced by being exposed to sunlight and tested by mostly civil debate, if a little robust inquiry. Now, by our reckoning, and if it's correct, the last speaker at the old Sydney Press Club was the Prime Minister John Curtin in 1942. So we are honoured today that the first address of this new venture is the Premier of New South Wales, Gladys Berejiklian. Will you please make her welcome? Thank you, Chris, for that very kind introduction. Can I thank you and your colleagues for hosting me here today on what is a momentous day in terms of the National Press Club. I'd also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the land in which we meet and pay my respect to elders past and present. I want to especially also uh, thank and acknowledge the presence of my parliamentary colleagues who are here, the Deputy Premier of New South Wales, John Barillaro, the Treasurer, John per Don Perite, and also the Minister for Transport and Infrastructure, Andrew Constance. It is a privilege to speak here at the first gathering of the National Press Club outside Canberra in 75 years. I welcome this Sydney gathering, not just as Premier of Australia's economic and infrastructure powerhouse and its most populous state, but because rational, considered debate is always the beating heart of vibrant liberal democracies. In New South Wales, the line between the media and politicians hasn't always been clear as it is today. I'm reminded that in the 19th century, John Norton, the notorious editor of the Truth newspaper and a member of the Legislative Assembly, was horsewhipped in Pitt Street by a fellow MP who had been accused by Norton's newspaper of being the premier perjurer of our public life and the champion criminal of the continent. Uh, Norton reacted to the whipping by attempting to shoot the MP three times. Uh, fortunately today, the role of politicians and the media is more dem demarcated and disputes are dealt with in more appropriate ways, which is a timely reminder for today, which happens to be World Press uh, Freedom Day. Although changes in the media industry have meant that national politics dominate more than ever before, your presence in Australia's largest and only truly global city is a reminder that many of the ideas that shape our country start outside of Canberra. And of course, uh, with the exception of the Batuta Advocate, Sydney is the headquarters for all major news organisations in Australia. News Corp, Fairfax, the three commercial television networks, two public broadcasters, uh, AAP and more recent entrants such as The Guardian, BuzzFeed and The New York Times. Uh, but also, uh, today is an opportunity for us to consider, uh, looking back in the history of the New South Wales Government, what we've achieved in the last six years. When we came to Government in 2011, we inherited budget deficits stretching to the, right, to the horizon and an economy that was trailing other states and acting like a handbrake on the national economy. Now, for the first time in a quarter of a century, New South Wales is the fastest growing state in Australia. Over the past two years, over 85% of Australia's domestic spending growth has come out of New South Wales. We have turned our state budget around. Over the next four years, the budget surplus is forecast to be over $7 billion, a far cry from the $3.7 billion in deficits we inherited. Our budget discipline is built on the basic strategy of reducing and holding expense growth below long-term revenue growth, and we are producing more uh, with less. We've also been disciplined in managing the balance sheet in the following ways. Our asset recycling of ports, the energy network, and our land titles business, unlocking to date more than $30 billion for infrastructure. Amalgamating over $65 billion in funds under management to T-Corp, and putting us in the top 10 largest fund managers in the nation. And tightening cash management across all agencies within government. In the general government sector, the result is that our state has no net debt. We are cash positive. Our investment in productive infrastructure and fiscal discipline has grown our net worth as a state to an estimated $182 billion, and it is forecast to grow another $67 billion, or nearly 37% over the next four years. That is more growth in four years than we saw in the previous 13. The reality is a large driver on the rise in net worth is the government's record infrastructure spending, which will see more than $73 billion invested over the next four years alone. This investment in infrastructure is also driving jobs in the private sector, 
because the private sector has the confidence to invest in a growing economy. As a result, New South Wales has the lowest unemployment rate in the nation at 5.1%. In the last two years, the number of jobs in New South Wales has grown by 131,000, with 51,000 of these in regional New South Wales. Business investment grew by 9.1%. In contrast, it fell by 15.7% across other states. The second strongest state to New South Wales was Victoria, where business investment still fell by 3.6%. We also have 42% of Australia's innovation startups, and we're home to 45% of ASX 200 company headquarters. When the Liberals to Nationals Coalition came to govern, government, New South Wales was running last on every meaningful economic indicator. It was the economic basket case of Australia. Now, once again, we are the engine room of Australia, right back where we should be, and we continue to grow. We promised that commitment when we came to government to make New South Wales number one again, and we have. And it gives me an enormous sense of pride when global leaders ask New South Wales how we've turned this around. And I want to stress, as you'd expect, that the turnaround in New South Wales is not a statistical blip, nor can it be simply attributed to our size or diversification or the result of the mining state slowing down after the boom. Rather, since 2011, the New South Wales government has purposefully and steadily been recalibrating the settings of government. We didn't do it by making government bigger, nor did we do it by spending money we did not have. We did it by doing government better. As Premier, it is not enough for me, for New South Wales, to be the best in class in Australia. I want to ensure that every infrastructure project we deliver and every service that we provide is comparable to the best in the world. This government has focused on sound economic management, fiscal discipline, spending restraint, asset recycling, infrastructure investment, productivity growth and a people-centred, customer-centric approach to everything we do. We also know that government doesn't have all the answers, and we've invited the private and not-for-profit sector to assist us where possible. We've rebuilt New South Wales brick by brick on a foundation of good government. Much of what we have done is truly bold and innovative, and some of it is just plain practical. I'm privileged to lead a truly reformist government guided by these strong principles of living within our means, providing taxpayers the best value for money, creating again a customer service approach, but also protecting the most vulnerable, and ensuring that we utilise the expertise outside of government as well as inside government. In large part, again, we've done it by getting the fundamentals right. We modernise outdated, expensive and tired bureaucratic management practices. We enforced a wages policy that limited public service pay rises to 2.5% unless they were accompanied by productivity growth. And we shifted the focus of our agencies from themselves, with all due respect, to the people they serve. And a couple of case studies is worth mentioning. The previous government and the public service had been working on an integrated ticketing system for 16 years. They tried to retrofit modern technology to the most archaic bureaucratic practices and to build a system that suited the multiple state agencies running transport services. Of course, that wouldn't work, so we started again. Our focus became the customer experience, not interagency warfare. And within two years, we had the Opal card. Today, three million customers use that card every day. We also put people at the centre again when we created Service New South Wales, a one-stop shop to meet every one of your interactions with state government. 850 possible transactions under one roof to be precise. Most of us here in New South Wales would remember the old days of renewing your licence where you had to take a packed lunch and a good book. Uh, today, the positive feedback we have about Service New South Wales makes you wonder why it wasn't done 20 years ago. Again, our focus is and was the customer experience. With every reform we have made across government, we have been met with reflex opposition, as you'd expect, from Labor, the unions, and those who profit from the status quo. Every time they said our actions were uncaring, that we were nasty, and that we were advocating austerity. The results disprove it. We streamlined the back offices of government, and with the savings, made our frontline delivery systems stronger than ever. We've completed more than 50 hospital and health centre developments and now have 5,300 more nurses and midwives. We've provided 550 new permanent classrooms catering for an additional 8,000 student places and have 3,800 more teachers in our schools. 
We have nearly 3,900 fewer staff across transport uh, agencies, but more than 19,000 extra weekly transport services. And we're currently overseeing the largest public transport and infrastructure boom in history. The benefits are also flowing through to taxpayers as well, helping reduce their cost of living. Last month, we reformed the CTP Green Slip Scheme with statewide average premiums dropping by up to $180. Water bills in Sydney, on average, are now $100 cheaper than a year ago. We also reduced the cost of parking at public hospitals, saving the families of those patients who need the most support as much as $200 a week. Wherever possible, we will reduce the burden on our taxpayers. But there is evidence of growing global disconnect between political classes and the citizen. Brexit, Trump and most recently parts of Europe are stark responses. Around the world, the tectonic plates upon which the post-war political foundations have been built are shifting. Each upheaval has been driven by individual issues, but we'd be naive not to draw comparisons with events closer to home and a rise in support for the minor parties. The digital age is driving this increasing pace of change. The information revolution is empowering many citizens, but for every, citi for every citizen who feels empowered, there is another feeling left behind. Citizens feel governments promise but don't deliver in a system which many do not feel works for them. In my view, state governments hold the key to countering popular disillusionment with the political process, simply because state governments touch people's lives in very tangible and meaningful ways. After all, we're the front line where government meets the people. In New South Wales, you'd expect me to say this, we have a government that does what it says and we deliver what we say we will. A government which we believe is reliable, dependable and accountable. And this is critical if we are to restore the community's faith in government and reconnect people with the political process. But strong and stable governments are still not immune from popular disillusionment. At its core, the dissatisfaction we are seeing is between those who are benefiting from the changing world and changing environment and those who are or feel left behind, or worse, left out altogether. Yes, New South Wales is growing. Yes, our economy is thriving. Yes, our government is delivering more infrastructure and more frontline services than ever. But 100 days ago when I became Premier, I stressed that I wanted every citizen in New South Wales to share in the economic success of our state. That I wanted every community in every corner of New South Wales to receive its fair share of the services and infrastructure we provide. As a Liberal, my philosophical grounding is the notion that every person, no matter what their postcode or circumstances, has the opportunity to make choices to be their best. People want and deserve a government that is responsive to their individual needs, whether they live in Burwood or Broken Hill. They want to be heard and understood, and not just once every four years at elections. They also expect and deserve to know the values and principles that guide government decision making. Today, people are more driven by issues than by traditional attachments to parties or ideologies. Politics is no longer a transactional experience that occurs every four years. It is relational and it occurs every single day. That means governments must, must take time to listen and make time to persuade as well. I want the government I lead to be Australia's first long-term reforming state government. And we will be if we continue to put the needs and concerns of people at the centre. We know that the reforming governments of the 1980s and 1990s, the Griner, Kennett and Goss governments, were outstanding but relatively short-lived. They were defeated when they were no longer able to bring the community along with them. The reality is New South Wales's reforms are working and our citizens are seeing the benefit at a macro level. But we need to ensure they feel the benefits in their daily experience. We are also punching well above our weight in bolstering the national economy. However, I believe we are being held back, as is the rest of the nation, by archaic structural arrangements. One area where I believe we can deliver better outcomes for our citizens and greater value to our economy is through reform of Commonwealth state relations. We are a commonwealth. In theory, we share in the bounty of each other's success. And as the largest state, New South Wales has also accepted that we will always have a part to play in supporting and strengthening the smaller states. As an Australian, I accept that and embrace that, but to a point. As the only nation on earth with a continent to itself, the Commonwealth is the greatest idea of modern Australia. 
but it is a concept which in practice needs a massive overhaul. The states and territories that make up our federation today are very different to the colonies that came together in 1901. We are different in our economies, different in our populations, and different in our outlook on the world. And as Australia continues to grow, those differences in population and outlook will become more stark. For instance, at the time of Federation, the population of New South Wales was three times the population of South Australia. Today, that gap has widened to a population four and a half times larger. By 2061, this is projected to increase to more than five times. The challenges and opportunities we face in New South Wales in terms of congestion, housing affordability and population growth are simply different to the challenges faced in other parts of the country. That is not to say the challenges faced by those other states are not legitimate and serious, they are. But it does mean that it will be even more difficult to find a consensus position that suits everyone in our federation. The truth is, modern federal state relations are clunky and now thrive on mediocrity. And they certainly move far too slowly for the community to have confidence that governments are taking action on the issues that matter most. Too often I've witnessed in frustration ministerial council meetings where the ACT, apologies for, to all of you, uh, with a population of around 400,000, not much more than the population of Blacktown Council in Western Sydney, has an equal voice with a state of 7.7 .7 million people. The people of New South Wales should not continue to be held hostage to a lowest common denominator approach that privileges the parochial interests of small populations more than it should. The cooperative federation or federalism started by Hawke and Griner 25 years ago, I believe, has run its course. In its desire to achieve national consensus on worthy matters, today it lacks commitment and direction. Some matters do and should require consensus, but many do not. We need to be real to the fact that the size of population and extent of economic resilience differs vastly across our continent. Too often COAG is a break on reform and in some cases a blockage and the challenges of COAG have become even more acute over the past decade. Today I'm calling for a new agenda of reforms that will be meaningful and practical for all Australians. An agenda with few issues and ones that are truly national in their focus an agenda that will have a real chance of delivering important reforms in a shorter time frame. Consistent with this, I want fewer agreements, fewer points of contact between the two levels of government, less red tape, less overlap and more trust. New South Wales has over 45 separate national partnerships and project agreements with the federal government with multiple layers of contact. This is not sustainable. The agreements are too prescriptive, too complex, and in the end, there is little ability to enforce the terms of the deals that we've agreed to. If we want to put our national interests first, we should have more bespoke arrangements that allow each state to progress to its full potential and make sure good, reforming state governments feel incentivised to work even harder and even faster. Perhaps a better approach is a system of earned autonomy. For the states that take the lead on reform, asset recycling, deregulation, service innovation, the federal government could step back and allow greater flexibility in how we deliver our responsibilities. We should be rewarded, not punished, by our state federal structures. Today I'm saying that we need to have an honest conversation about what works in our federation and what doesn't, and that we need a more flexible approach to deal with increasingly diverse circumstances. Let's try it with one state by looking to more bilateral arrangements between the Commonwealth and a state. And if it can work, then others can choose to embrace it. In the coming months, New South Wales will put a more detailed approach to the Commonwealth about how we believe we can modernise this vital relationship. New South Wales wants to lead the way in developing a more dynamic federal federalism, more suited to this century than the last. But I do welcome the Commonwealth Government's decision to refer GST equalisation arrangements to the Productivity Commission. The current arrangements blunt the incentives for reform. New South Wales has long advocated an equal per capita distribution of the GST. This would not take away from our national responsibility to the smaller states, but it would provide a more appropriate distribution. Equal per capita distribution would still mean that we would raise more GST revenue in New South Wales than we would receive, as we have a stronger and more vibrant economy with high incomes and expenditure. In fact, an equal per capita distribution would still result in over $4 billion handed over to other states over the forward estimates. This is on top of New South Wales' higher contribution to Commonwealth revenues from personal income tax, company tax and capital gains tax relative to other states. 
Reform of the GST formula needs to deliver a fairer deal for New South Wales taxpayers. Our declining share of GST payments has increasingly shifted the burden to our own tax sources. An equal per capita distribution would return $13 billion to the people of New South Wales over the next four years. A move in this direction would tilt the balance towards rewarding good outcomes for reforming states. It would also give us further options to reduce the tax burden on our own citizens. Ladies and gentlemen, but we know our country and our state is more than an economy. It's a society, a community and a neighbourhood. For many years, Australians have been engaged in an ongoing debate about our national identity, what it means to be Australian and the values and ideals that bind us together. My surname has an Armenian heritage, but it now represents an Australian life. My parents immigrated separately to Australia about half a century ago. They came from families that experienced genocide and from countries experiencing conflict, lost opportunity and an uncertain future. My parents sought to navigate two different worlds, but constantly reminded my sisters and I about how fortunate we were to be born and raised in Australia. They worked hard as a welder and a nurse. They came from a community with tight bonds and some views of the world that many in this room might see as antiquated. Yet this background produced the Liberal Party's first female Premier in New South Wales, a Premier who has a far more liberal and different view of the world. The values of respect, hard work and civic respons responsibility were instilled in my sisters and I from an early age. These values sustain me and still do. It is these values that will be the hallmarks of the government I have the honour of leading. Longevity of a reformist government will only be assured if we build stronger communities and demonstrate that every part of this state feels they are sharing in the success of New South Wales. British PM Theresa May calls this a shared society with an emphasis on not just individual rights, but also individual responsibility. One which respects the value of family, community, citizenship and strong communities. In a similar vein, I want our government's approach to involve the citizen in the political process for a new era of engagement between community and government so we can help create stronger communities together. This will also mean sharing resources and expertise collaboratively with government, private and not-for-profit sectors. We accept completely that Macquarie Street is not the sole repository of wisdom in this state and it's certainly not the sole repository of enterprise, innovation and capital. For instance, we've partnered with the social sector to deliver truly world-leading social impact investments that challenge intractable social problems across areas like restoring children in out-of-home care back to their parents, reducing reoffending rates and providing client-centred mental health services. We've also committed to thousands of new social and affordable houses in partnership with private sector and non-government organisations to support some of the most vulnerable in our community. We are a government who knows strong economic management is not an end in itself. It's the means by which we are able to protect the vulnerable and help those who need it most. We are less concerned with who provides the service than making sure those services are delivered in a way that suits the citizen and makes life just that bit easier for ordinary people. In short, we are making sure that the citizen is at the heart of everything we do. Only by continuing to use the resources and expertise of those best placed, whether it is government, whether it is the private sector or the not-for-profit sector, can New South Wales deliver the best for its citizens. The government's challenge is not just to keep this culture of reform and improvement ongoing, but it's also maintaining faith with our community. Also ensuring the community helps us identify the opportunities and the solutions. In contrast to the reformist but ultimately short-term governments of Kennett, Griner and Goss, the previous New South Wales Labor government held office for 16 years and outside of the delivery of the Olympic Games, which incidentally the bid was won by the coalition government, um, you can't point to many significant achievements. Eventually, uh, and apologies for being a bit too political, it became the worst government since the Rum Corps and so much of the good work of the Faye Griner governments was undone. Unfortunately, the harsh political truth is that governments that pursue an ongoing reform agenda are more likely to be punished than those who sit back and do nothing. But I am determined to change this trend completely. By increasing the focus on our citizens, by having a completely customer-centric approach to all that we do, and by ensuring that every corner of New South Wales shares in the success of New South Wales, will demonstrate not just the merits, but the necessity for us to constantly improve how government delivers. After all, it is strong government and strong economic management that gives each and every individual the opportunity to make their own choices and to be their best. Thank you very much.
go now to our, our questions uh, from journalists, but I might begin. The compact of the Commonwealth Grants Commission is that each Australian has access to the same level of services, and that's why we have this distribution of income between the states to poorer states. You mentioned the ACT. Surely a better example is Tasmania or the Northern Territory. And when you get more money for New South Wales, you will be taking money from them, won't you? So aren't you going to be breaching that compact of the Commonwealth? Oh, not at all. And you can take your, your pick on any of the smaller states. The example rings true. Uh, but what I'm suggesting is the challenges we have here in a population of 7.7 .7 million people are very different to the challenges faced in Tasmania, the ACT and the Northern Territory. So I, for one, am completely accepting New South Wales will always be in a, population, in a position given our scale to support the, the other states, but not to the extent we do and not to the extent that we're disincentivised from actually doing better. You shouldn't be punished for being a good, strong government. And of course, the stronger we are, the more we're able to contribute to the other states. The more the shackles are left off us and we continue to grow, the more we're able to increase our contribution to the other states. Uh, all I'm suggesting is that uh, the circumstances where the colonies came together in 1901, irrespective uh, of, the, of the decades that have passed, are very different today. And a, a state the size and scale of New South Wales has very different challenges to some of the smaller states. We need to accept that. So I'm not for a second suggesting we should step back from our responsibility of supporting the other states. We should, but not in the way we are, not in the extent we are. And, and that's where I think we re require revision. And it's not just about the dollars. It's about having the focus on issues that matter to us the most to take the level of service provision and infrastructure delivered to the next level in terms of improving the quality of life of all of our citizens. Great. We'll go now to our questions from the floor. Oh, look, I'll call the masthead and if uh, the journalists could identify themselves for our national audience and we'll begin with Network 10. Thanks, Chris, and thank you, Premier, for your speech. Catalina Flores from Network 10. Now, the day you became Premier, perhaps you bravely declared that you'd fix the housing affordability crisis in New South Wales. A hundred days in, other than appoint Glenn Stephen as an advisor, there's no real grand plans that have been revealed and the state remains divided between the have and have nots in terms of property. What hope can you give not only to young people but others too that your government actually does have the answers and isn't it true that any changes you make here in Sydney largely depends on big changes in Canberra too? Uh, firstly, uh, I believe it's absolutely necessary for the government of the day and the leader of that government to discuss the issues that are topical for all of our citizens. I don't know of a household or a barbecue or any event in New South Wales where property prices aren't discussed and specifically housing affordability. And uh, I was extremely committed and determined as I am today 100 days ago to address that challenge. In New South Wales, we're doing very well to deal with the challenge. We inherited a lot of pent up demand. Uh, we have record approvals in terms of housing uh, approvals in New South Wales in terms of dwellings, more than 73,000 in the last 12 months. That's an all-time high. We're also seeing uh, a greater increase in the rate of construction and uh, in the different, or the less time it takes from, uh, from approvals to construction, but we do need to do more. And uh, I've always said, and the Treasurer is here, uh, and the upcoming budget fall is allowing those people trying to get into the market for the first time. And I knew what it took for me to save and get into the market. My first place wasn't my best place or my dream place, but I was able to, on my salary, to work hard and, and, and find a home. And I want everybody in New South Wales who works hard to have that opportunity. So we'll be solving to make sure that those who aspire to have their own home do have the opportunity in our state to do so. And I did want to make this point, which makes New South Wales different from Brisbane and, uh, and Melbourne in particular is a lot of the new units that we are constructing are outside the CBD of Sydney. If you go to Western Sydney, to Blacktown, to Penrith and other locations, you will see enormous development of new dwellings. Uh, and obviously increasing supply puts downward pressure on prices. But we have also said that we will consider demand side opportunities as well. Supply is the key. Glenn Stevens, I'm thrilled, um, accepted uh, uh, my offer, my personal, uh, my personal invitation to make sure he looks over our shoulder, to make sure whatever package we put forward doesn't have unintended consequences. The last thing you want to do is create heat in a market which has the opposite effect of putting downward pressure on prices. But surely the biggest demand side lever that can be pulled on the uh, federal government side is immigration. 200,000 people net a year, many of them wanting to live in Sydney. Is that a lever that you'd want the federal government to pull? Well, I think we want to have a, a lever of offering choices. In fact, uh, we are experiencing the largest levels of net migration in New South Wales from places like 
WA and Queensland. So we're seeing people leaving mining sites in WA and Queensland and coming on, on, on railway sites, on, on construction sites in New South Wales. So we are seeing the highest levels of neg migration from people around Australia uh, since the 1970s, in fact. Uh, that's not a bad thing. People should have the ability to choose where they live. New South Wales is where the jobs are. Uh, New South Wales has a great quality of life, great standard of living. Why wouldn't you want to come here? But, um, but the point is, the point is, I don't believe that we should tell people where to live or what choices they should make, but we should provide the opportunities to allow people to exercise those choices. ABC News. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Premier Bridget Lamb. Uh, former Prime Minister Tony Abbott has repeatedly said the power of the factional warlords in New South Wales, within the New South Wales Liberals, needs to be broken. Do you agree? And if so, how can you do that? Oh, thank you for the question, Bridget. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure uh, many of you who have been members of the National Press Club for decades would know that uh, some things don't change since the 70s, 80s and 90s. Uh, but what is important, what the community needs and wants to know, is they have a government focused on their interests. And uh, that has been our focus since day one of being elected to New South Wales, and that will continue to be our focus. I think the community expects us to have top of mind what they, their needs and concerns are. We need to keep the focus on being a good government, uh, delivering for the people we represent. And I think so long as our focus remains that, uh, we will deliver better outcomes. Are you going to do anything about the, the party system? Oh, look, uh, the party organisation is what it is. And I take pride in the fact that we allow people to express their views. We allow people to have debate. You don't sign up for politics unless you have strong views. So you can hardly say to anybody, sign up, express your, or well, actually don't express your views. That's not how we work on our side of politics. We allow people to, to express those views. And I, I think those views also demonstrate the broad range of views that exist in the community. And that strengthens us. So I'm all for people uh, expressing their views, but I think where government's concerned, it's important for us to show the focus, the discipline and the integrity the community expects us to have in, in delivering for them. The Daily Telegraph. Premier Andrew Clonell, Daily Telegraph. Um, just to follow on from my colleagues, the two biggest issues facing your government as you seek to be re-elected, I see at the moment as housing affordability and internal divisions in the Liberal Party. On housing affordability, even a well-paid household, if they were buying now in Sydney, would not be able to afford principal and interest re repayments on a freestanding house within QE of the city. Um, is it time to reintroduce first homeowner grants for existing homes to give a leg up over investors, or should people have different expectations about home ownership? On the internal division, it's clear there are some people in your party, including in the parliament, who would rather square up with each other than see the government re-elected. So how do you propose to deal with this? Discipline people, unite the party when it seems some right-wingers can't cop you, just as in Canberra they can't cop Malcolm Turnbull. Uh, firstly, I'll deal with the first issue first on housing affordability, and as I answered uh, Catalina's question, we are considering a whole range of options um, in relation to first homeowners in particular. And uh, in due course, we'll be very pleased to respond to those. But uh, I don't for a second shy away from identifying issues which matter most to the people of this state. I don't shy away from the fact that a state government should do everything in its power and responsibility to improve a challenge like housing affordability. And we've done a lot. Uh, we have done a lot. We've, we've, we've reduced the gap that we inherited in terms of pent up demand, but of course we need to do more. And I remember when I was uh, looking to purchase my first home, interest rates were about 17 or 18 per cent, so I would worry about repaying my mortgage. There's no doubt that every generation has its challenges, but that's not to take away from the challenges that exist today. And in terms of the values of respect and hard work and civic responsibility, uh, for me, housing affordability relates to that because you want to make sure that people who aspire to own their home in New South Wales have the capacity to do that. And my government, our government, will do everything we can to make that possible. And certainly, uh, we appreciate the challenges with that. We appreciate there are, there are levers outside the control of state government which, uh, which contribute to that. 
but uh, we are looking forward to putting forward a package which we believe builds on the strong legacy we, we've already done, we've already had. And I also want to stress, uh, you made the comment, Andrew, of saying, uh, you know, chance of buying a, ho a home, QE, QE of the Sydney CBD. Uh, but I also want to stress that uh, commensurate with our housing affordability package, we're investing billions in new rail lines, new road networks, the social infrastructure, the schools and the houses, which actually allow people to get really good jobs outside of the Sydney CBD, but also give access uh, to great public transport and the road network to people. So uh, I think it's really important and incumbent when you're dealing with the issue of housing affordability that you make that commensurate investment in the transport and road network, but also in the social investment in hospitals and schools to support that growth. And that's exactly what we're doing on a level which hasn't been done before in New South Wales on a level that hasn't been done before in New South Wales. Uh, in relation to the second part of your question, um, uh, I'm extremely pleased with the way in which our government has acted uh, in the last 100 days. Uh, the transition, if I'm honest, is smoother than I expected, is more seamless than I expected, and I'm really proud of all the things we've done in the last 100 days, not only to demonstrate that we'll continue to be a better government delivering the services and infrastructure the state needs, continuing to be the economic and infrastructure powerhouse of Australia, but also, but also a government that appreciates the importance of listening to the community and responding to their needs and concerns. And I will always focus on those issues that matter to the community, as will my parliamentary team. And I've got some of my colleagues here today, and I couldn't be prouder of all my colleagues who are continuing to demonstrate, I would think, uh, to other states and potentially other jur jurisdictions what a good government can achieve. And I made the comment perhaps a bit flippantly in my address, but world leaders do actually ask me about PPPs and asset recycling and social impact investment, things that New South Wales is doing really well. And that's an enormous sense of pride. And so long as we keep focusing on ensuring that our regional communities, that our suburbs, uh, that our highly densely populated parts of the state are getting the services and infrastructure we need, so long as that remains our focus, our government will continue to be disciplined and focused and build on the things we've already achieved and take the state to the next level. Nine Network. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Premier. Chris O'Keefe, Nine Network. The, the Prime Minister tells us we're in the middle of, of a gas crisis, a national gas crisis. There's serious issues around gas supply and gas security across the country. As of July 1, your government has decided to deregulate the gas market here in New South Wales. Already uh, retailers like Dodo are charging more than AGL and Origins, IPART regulated gas price. Do you think this decision has come at the worst possible time? And will households and small businesses have protections from price gouging? Hmm. Well, firstly, um, we pride ourselves on the fact that we are a government that has a keen eye on the cost of living. So Chris, as you appreciate, uh, every time I stand up and we deal with issues affecting households, cost of living is important, uh, important to us. Uh, firstly, um, obviously we would encourage anything that increases competition and puts downward pressure on those household bills. But we would also, first and foremost, uh, in this debate, ensure that we have the energy sources to keep downward pressure on household bills, and that's a primary objective. Uh, but. Uh, we also, because of our strength of our economic position, we literally spend billions of dollars every year providing rebates to those most vulnerable. So people who receive welfare payments or those most vulnerable do receive from the state government enormous rebates on, on their household bills and that will continue. But I want to assure you, uh, and thank you for the question you posed, because it does give me an opportunity to say uh, that our economic success means we do have the resources to support those most vulnerable in relation to household bills, but we would also encourage uh, in terms of competition in the retail sector or other sectors, uh, downward pressure on prices through that process. Uh, but for us, uh, securing our energy sources and keeping downward pressure on household bills are our absolute priorities. What about unconventional gas sources? Are you prepared to take on that fight, fracking? Oh, look, we've, uh, in fact, um, now that you've uh, started that conversation, Chris, when we came to government, uh, we inherited a number of controversial licences, CSG, a number of controversial licences, and we spent a good few years in our first years of government sorting that out. We've now got in place a very stringent regulatory environment uh, that protects 
uh, key land areas that protects key catchments. Uh, and certainly we pride ourselves on having cleaned up uh, and meeting communities' expectations in that regard. So uh, we are open uh, to, looking at, uh, to looking at energy sources so long as they comply with the strict regulations we've got in place, so long as they comply with what communities' expectations are around energy sources. But uh, we're a government that looks at things on a case-by-case -case basis, and I'm proud of the fact that we cleaned up a whole bunch of licences we inherited, which didn't meet the community's expectations. We've put in a very strong regulatory framework as a result, and now we're in a position to look at things on a case-by-case -case basis. Radio 2 C. Uh, Premier Tim Shaw from Radio 2 C in Canberra. Thank you very much for your address. Um, the second airport is open. It's the Canberra International Airport. I just wanted to let you know that. Thank you. Um, We're also delivering one in Newcastle, as the Transport <laughs> Minister announced a few days ago. Yeah. I'll get to Newcastle and Sydney <laughs> Wollongong in a minute. Um, Premier, it's interesting because the Deputy Premier of New South Wales was here today and the member for Goulburn are screaming for support for their voters, their taxpayers in New South Wales. Now, around the ACT, who you have said today arguably doesn't have an equal uh, opportunity at the COAG table, or words to that effect about the parochial nature of how the territories are treated. Uh, can I just put to you that the taxpayers of New South Wales that use Canberra hospitals, schools, fantastic infrastructure, and more importantly, Premier, are wanting your government to deliver to them the fairness and equity that you said all New South Wales taxpayers deserve. Now, will John Barillaro and Prue Goward and I be on Zimmer frames before the Barton Highway is duplicated? You don't need to wait for Scott Morrison to do that. And secondly, congratulations on ordering a tender for uh, an investigation into the faster train link between Kingston Railway Station and also uh, up to Sydney. And what do you say to critics that say it used to be Newcastle, Sydney and Wollongong, now it's southwest Sydney, now it's south west. What do you say to the six billion going into the west? Is it buying boats? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that um, multi-pronged question. Uh, and, and I could invite the Deputy Premier to answer, but I won't. I'll have a go at it myself. Uh, firstly, we're very proud of the fact that uh, the proceeds of our asset recycling, we've committed 30% of that to regional New South Wales. So we've accumulated about $30 billion already, and there is still a transaction we're going through. 30% uh, of that goes straight into rural and regional New South Wales. So the investment we're seeing in rural and regional New South Wales is unprecedented. So if you just do it on, on that straight uh, analysis, that's at least $10 billion from that new money. But also our ongoing infrastructure program has at least a third of all of our ongoing infrastructure program going towards rural and regional New South Wales. And uh, I appreciate, though, the important point you make is it's not just about spending the dollars, it's about making sure that every community feels that we're prioritising what's important to them. Yeah, you can, have, you can have all the money in the world, but unless you've listened to the community and appreciate what they feel is important to them, they'll say, why are you building me a multi-billion dollar X when I want X? When I just want the toilets upgraded at the local sporting field or I want an extra classroom in my local school? So that's why uh, in the last 100 days, we've really focused on what we call that local infrastructure, the local things that make a difference to people. We're in a position now to deliver on that. And I really feel that that's a step change to perhaps where we were in the last six years. We were focused on getting the macro fundamentals right. We were focused on getting New South Wales where it needs to be in terms of our economic strength and our infrastructure pipeline. And now that we've done that, we obviously have pressure on us to maintain that and to deliver on that and continue to do so. But I believe we also have an enormous opportunity uh, to listen to the community and make sure that local infrastructure, the billions and billions of dollars we have to go into uh, regional New South Wales, uh, is where people need it to go and is what is going to make a difference to their lives. And interestingly, the challenges, as the Deputy Premier would acknowledge, in rural and regional New South Wales are far different from those uh, in the cities. Uh, rural and regional New South Wales is crying out for more development. They want more population. Uh, they want to see their town grow, uh, grow and prosper. And, uh, and we're about supporting that. And it gives me heart that we've created about 50,000 jobs uh, in, New South, in regional New South Wales in the last little while, which adds to that story about making sure regional communities feel not only that they're successful and sustainable, but they have a bright future. And when you've got the resources, you're able to do that. Um, but again, uh, you know, I, I didn't mean to offend anybody in the ACT by, by, by making that, that analysis. I could, have used, I could have used any other smaller state. But um, in the last six years, and it's not just the hallmark of the last decade, but perhaps at least the last decade and a half, when I've attended ministerial council meetings as a larger state, 
Um, you know, we, you go around the table and everybody is treated as though their challenges are the same, their, their view of the world's the same, their populations are the same, their economic resilience is the same. And there's a lot we do have in common, but there's a lot we don't. And I just think our federation needs to take the next step of modernising itself and accepting that the ACT, as important as critical as it is, has a very different view of the world and different needs than a broader population as diverse as New South Wales with 7.7 .7 million people. So that's the point I'm trying to make, not taking away from anybody, but simply suggesting that the way the Federation has worked to date no longer serves the wellbeing of our states and our nation. Because I would also argue that if you let New South Wales off the leash a bit more, uh, we would actually be able to generate even more uh, growth more for the, we've already contributed 85% uh, of growth to, to, the, to the nation and we're happy to do more if we have those opportunities. And I think at the end of the day, it's not about the economic outcomes, it's about the quality of life you then can provide your citizens by providing the infrastructure and services they need. Um, and, and that's exactly what I think we should be looking at. Okay. Before I call the next question, I should say that the Sydney Morning Herald is not just one of the great mastheads of the nation, it's one of the great mastheads of the world and we are all disappointed to hear about the job losses at Fairfax today. So Sydney Morning Herald. Sean, you're safe though, I'm sure. <laughs> for the time being. Thanks very much for that, Chris. Appreciate it very much. Um, Premier, thanks for your address. Um, uh, just noting two things, Westpac being a major sponsor of this uh, press club and also your government's target of zero net emissions uh, by 2050. I wanted to ask you what your view of the future of coal in New South Wales is. And secondly, just alluding to what Chris just mentioned, uh, uh, do you have a response to the news about the job cuts at Fairfax today? Hmm. Uh, firstly, uh, what I am primarily concerned about when you ask me the question of the future of coal is to make sure that we manage the transition uh, to renewables or other sources of energy in a responsible way. My first and foremost concern is to secure the energy security of, of the citizens of New South Wales and to also have a keen eye on the cost of living. So I appreciate um, the, the emissions targets we have as a nation. I appreciate New South Wales's responsibility in, in meeting those targets. But first and foremost, my concern is to secure our energy sources, to make us resilient. We are the most resilient state when it comes to energy, but we are still vulnerable because of uh, what other states might decide or what they choose to do and the rate at which they're moving to, to renewables. Uh, so the aspiration is there, but first and foremost, my concern remains uh, maintaining the, the uh, energy security and resilience of New South Wales, but also keeping household uh, bills down as much as possible. But I do appreciate those targets are there and we should aim towards them, but responsibly. Well, the coal industry will continue to the extent that we need that source of energy. And we have to be responsible about that. Uh, but accept that we have those targets, we need to meet them. Uh, but we need to do so in a responsible way. You can't just transition uh, without securing the energy sources for your state and the contribution your state has to make to the nation. So all of us can, can in principle have, have values that we aspire to in terms of sources of energy, and New South Wales is part of that. But you need to make the transition in a responsible way that doesn't let down citizens if there is pressure on, the, on, uh, on energy sources. And on Fairfax? And on Fairfax. Um, look, I'm the last person to tell private organisations or non, uh, government organisations what they should do. But I can say that as someone who's been uh, in public life now for 14, close to 15 years, the additional pressure on journalists uh, to be all things at all times. And I've seen the impact that the 24-hour news cycle has on my industry. And I've certainly seen the impact it has on your industry. And I empathise. It is not easy. We are all negotiating these changing times uh, as best we can. And of course, uh, my heart goes out to those people who are told today they no longer have jobs. It's a difficult pill to swallow, and especially because uh, I'm someone who respects true journalism, the art of journalism. I don't want us to lose that. It's really easy for someone to come along and have a superficial view of the world. Uh, but someone who has uh, that deep knowledge of corporate history uh, and sense of, uh, sense of direction and also context is able to make, I think, a much greater contribution to public commentary than somebody who is doing three or four things at the one time. So uh, I hope that answers your question in that regard. Hmm. Uh, the Tokyo Broadcasting System. Ah. Oh. Uh, hello. <laughs> hello. Uh, thanks, Chris. Hello, thanks, Priya. 
By the way, I'm living in North Bridge. Oh, next North to Bridge. Mirabi. That's yes. where I live. Thank yes. you. <laughs> we have the largest Japanese population in yes, New South Wales right. in North Bridge. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to quickly add uh, uh, two questions. And the first, of, uh, first question is uh, maybe this is not really a state uh, uh, issue, but I need to ask you about the, uh, what, what is your view of the kind of North Korean issue? Because uh, there are many Chinese oh, yeah. and North Japan Korea. and no, North Korea, oh, North Korea issue, you. sorry. Yeah. There's many uh, Chinese and Korean um, and Japanese living here. And as you said, the New South, New South Wales is, is a quite a multicultural the, uh, state. And the second one is, uh, are you going to visit Tokyo or China soon? Because uh, New South Wales is a uh, sister relationship with uh, Tokyo. And uh, I think uh, your predecessor, uh, Mark Bell, visited the, uh, Tokyo the uh, short after he became uh, prime minister. I think it's really quite important to make a good uh, relationship with uh, Tokyo and uh, everything. So, and also, the uh, new Tokyo mayor is a uh, female and uh, very popular and very strong leader like you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you for the, the, the three questions. Uh, firstly, I share the concerns of our, our federal government and global leaders in relation to what's going on in North Korea. Uh, there's no other word to describe what's going on than uh, two words than deeply concerning. Uh, and certainly, uh, as, as a state, New South Wales will continue to, to support the efforts of, of our federal government and all global leaders uh, in trying to uh, uh, certainly uh, reduce the tension uh, generated in that part of the world. Uh, in relation to visiting China and Japan, definitely. Uh, towards the end of the year, I'm looking forward to, to, to make those, uh, those trips. But um, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, the contribution made by some global companies who are, who are now in New South Wales because of our strong conditions and our infrastructure pipeline. We're not only seeing many Asian companies uh, set up shop here, but many European and North American companies. And that's really giving us heart because we're able to combine Australia's best expertise with global best expertise. And that's why we are delivering so well on our infrastructure pipeline and also the quality of our service delivery. So um, it really excites me to know the extent to which our financial services sector is growing and the contribution this is making to supporting our infrastructure pipeline, but also in really attracting people to set up shop here in New South Wales. The financial services hub uh, being established in Barangaroo can't be underestimated. Uh, it, is, it is attracting world attention. Uh, without disclosing too much, uh, at least two of the recent uh, global leaders who were in New South Wales, who I had the privilege of meeting, mentioned it to me and, and talked about the strength of our corporate governance practices and regulatory regime in, in New South Wales and, and broadly Australia. And so I want to obviously see those opportunities develop further. And what was the third one? Oh, I'm looking forward to hopefully one day meet the new mayor of Tokyo. So uh, she represents many more people than I do. <laughs> And I'm sure she would have a, a lot of advice on how to bring the community along with her as she, as she uh, helps deliver services and opportunities to one of the greatest cities um, on the planet. Thank you. Australian Associated Press. Thank you, Premier. Uh, Stephanie Menezes from Australian Associated Press. Uh, Premier, your Education Minister has today said uh, New South Wales will be millions and millions of dollars worse off uh, with the federal government's new funding, schools funding plan. Um, has the federal government started a new war with Gonski 2.0? And how far are you willing to take up that fight? Mm. Look, uh, I'd say no is a brief answer to your second part of your question. But certainly, um, New South Wales doesn't, uh, doesn't shy away from the fact that we expect the original agreements and funding arrangements we signed up to to be delivered. And that's a position we'll continue to advocate. So we were very pleased to be the first, first state to sign up to the Gonski agreements. And uh, we will continue to ensure those agreements are honoured. And we've articulated that publicly and privately to our colleagues over a number of occasions, and we'll continue to do that. And that's something uh, we, won't, we won't digress from. But I am heartened by the federal government's commitment to needs-based funding, because it's not just the dollars, but it's also, uh, it's also how they're spent. And um, I'm heartened by the principles they outlined yesterday in relation to where education funding will go in terms of needs basis. But uh, I don't want to take away for a second uh, the fact that myself, the New South Wales Education Minister and entire government uh, will ensure that the agreement we, set, we, we signed up to is delivered. And that remains our position. Seven News. Thank you, Premier. Brian Seymour, Seven News. Just on that, your uh, Education Minister, Rob Stokes, was asked yesterday if he'd go to court to seek a remedy to this, and he said he's considering all available options. So uh, what legal remedies are there available to you in mm. terms of these arrangements, and how confident are you going forward we can improve the educational outcomes in New South Wales classrooms? Yeah, uh, 
Firstly, um, I commend my education minister for his passion and advocacy, and he's certainly articulating the sentiments of our government uh, in sending a very clear and strong message to our federal colleagues and friends uh, that we will continue to ensure and do everything we can to make sure those funding arrangements that are in place are met here in New South Wales. Uh, in relation to opportunities we have to, uh, to deal with that, we'll start on the premise that we expect those funding arrangements to be met and certainly we'll be paying uh, a close eye on the detail that will be released over the next few days and especially on, on Budget Day in relation to what the funding arrangements means over our forward estimates period in particular. So we'll be taking a keen eye to see what it means in year two, three and four of our, of our budget and beyond. Um, what's the second part of your question again? How confident are you, particularly with math, science and uh, literacy, oh, yeah, thank you can you. achieve better outcomes under these new arrangements? No, thank you. Well, certainly New South Wales has one of its Premier's priorities to really improve the uh, numeracy and literacy rates of our, of our students. And uh, the fact that the federal government's now outlined a needs-based approach to funding gives me heart because that directs relately to performance and outcomes as opposed to just the funding that's going in there. But in New South Wales, we have a very special focus on identifying schools where we, pre we feel improvements can be made on. In fact, I had a, an excellent meeting with our education minister and our implementation unit to actually look at how we, we are implementing what's called a bump up program. So we're identifying schools where we think the outcomes could be better and actually taking an individualised approach to that school. And the teachers love it because uh, their school gets the attention they need, but the parents love it because we're actually able to use data and to use performance outcomes or, 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 um, or exam results to identify where we think schools can improve and, and support those schools individually to make those improvements. Because we are focused on outcomes. Uh, we are focused on making sure the principle that every child in this state, no matter what their home life is like, no matter what they, where they live and what their circumstances, should have access to an excellent education. I'm a product of the New South Wales public education system. Um, I went through the primary and, and secondary education system through the public system in New South Wales and I want to make sure the opportunities I had 20 years ago don't only exist today but into the future and needs-based funding allows us to do that but it also allows, allows us to raise the benchmarks because uh, we want to keep raising our standards, uh, not having to equalise them and I think the needs-based funding will, will allow all states to really improve their outcomes. Just lastly, and for clarity, there are no legal options available to New South Wales, are there? Uh, not that I know of, but my education minister um, has a PhD and he might actually have had <laughs> Interesting to find one. Okay, <laughs> last quick question we've got time for is from the Weekly Times. Mr Booth, Premier. how are you? Wonderful, wonderful to see you. Thanks for coming. Thank you for coming. I'll lip, give my lip to you. I'll take one little tip out of uh, Andrew from the telly, because I started there before he was born as a copy boy. So, uh, and that was to ask two quick questions directed not at the previous Labor government, but at your government. Number one, uh, before you were elected, uh, you were in favour of having electric buses in the city of Sydney. I did ask you at a subsequent uh, luncheon, why are we having 200 year old technology with steel on steel tracks, turning uh, Sydney, disrupting Sydney into a sort of second-rate lunar park, <laughs> taking away a 1,000 car parking spaces. Suffice to say, I've known Mr Booth for a long time, so it's OK. Yeah. De 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 <laughs> destroying destroying um, hundreds of businesses along the way. Uh, John, can we cut to the chase? trees. Mm? Can we cut to the chase? Really? OK, I, I just wanted to ask you, um, have, have you had second thoughts? Uh, do, you, do you sort of now... Um, a bit sorry that you took that, that um, approach. And I'd like to ask you, who changed your mind? I know you did say to me before, you changed your mind, and Barry O'Farrell, when he was Premier, the same luncheon said he changed his mind. I'd like to know, who was the bureaucrat that changed your mind? <laughs> and have you checked his Swiss bank account? And secondly... All right, no, that's, that's fine. I think there's sufficient questions there, John, because we're, we're rapidly approaching the end of the broadcast, so I might get Thank to Thank you. Uh, John, can I just say, I think uh, the light rail project, which I'm assuming you're alluding to in the CBD in the south-east, is one of the 
the great transformational projects of our era. And uh, we looked at all options uh, to decongest our city and to allow people from all over New South Wales to access major events and travel around our city uh, as efficiently as possible. And uh, I'm delighted with the progress of the project and I want to thank the Transport Minister who's here for the work he's done as well. Uh, but uh, the benefit I had was being a Shadow Minister in Transport for four years. So you can assume that when I came to government, uh, we'd done our homework. And that is by far the best option. Unfortunately, the number of buses in the CBD uh, was creating a further car park. And interestingly, the business investment that's come on the back of that project is really exciting. Many businesses along the route are actually uh, upgrading their buildings because they know the foot traffic and the opportunities for them will increase once the project's open. And I'm looking forward to that. And I'll take you on a ride when it's open and, uh, and disprove you. Thank you. Please thank the Premier. Thank you.